Thanks very much to the chairs and to the organizing committee for the kind invitation to speak today. Uh, once again, my name is Julie Lubshin. I'm an endocrinologist and clinician scientist at the University of Toronto, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you today to talk about SGLT2 inhibitors and cardiorenal mechanisms in diabetes and beyond. Now, before I begin, here are my disclosures. And here are my objectives for our talk together. We have about 25 minutes together, and this is an expanded lecture from the one that was presented in the symposium. Here, what we're going to do is really focus in on the cardio renal effects of SGLT2 inhibitors in type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So our focus is on the interaction between the kidney and the heart with SGLT2 inhibitors. So as an endocrinologist in 2021, I do feel very fortunate because I have several therapies to help treat my patients with type 2 diabetes uh, for blood sugar lowering. But there are two uh, drug therapies that really stand out among the others, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are able to modify hard outcomes and complications in my patients with type 2 diabetes, including diabetic kidney disease, heart disease, obesity, and metabolic diseases. So from here on in, we're just gonna focus on the SGLT2 inhibitors in the kidney and in the heart. So I think a great place to begin is to review the cardiovascular outcome trials. This was the first data that we saw with SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes in either at risk or with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, as a reminder, these trials were actually initially just designed to show cardiovascular safety, but they were powered to show superiority for major cardiovascular events. And as we can see with Empareg in the M with using empagliflozin, uh, it significantly reduced the relative risk for major adverse cardiovascular death. Uh, and this primary outcome was driven by a reduction, as you can see, primarily in heart failure, but as well as in CV death. And there was also a reduction in all-cause mortality and favorable effects on kidney outcomes, though a lot of enthusiasm was garnered for SGLT2 inhibitors with the Empareg outcome trial. Now, over the subsequent last five years, there's been three other trials completed, the CAMBA Canvas program with Canagaflozin, the DECLARE TIMI58 trial with dapagliflozin and the VERTA-CV trial with ertagliflozin, which was more recently completed. Now, as we can see here in the subsequent trials, there is some heterogeneity in terms of uh, significance. However, we can see numerically in all of the trials, uh, the drug SGLD2 inhibitors was favored over placebo in the risk for major adverse cardiovascular events. And subsequent medic analysis has gone on to show that there is a class effect with respect to these outcomes for the four SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, if we look on the far left panel, we can see that under the hospitalization for heart failure category, there is a consistent and really robust reduction for heart failure in this patient population at least 30%, if not more. And not shown in this slide, as I mentioned, favorable renal outcomes have also been shown in these cardiovascular outcome trials. So the caveat, though, that I want to remind you is that not a, min uh, a minority of patients, rather, uh, had actual heart failure in these trials, and a minority of patients had really uh, significant chronic CKD. So this led to other trials being conducted, which we're now gonna focus our attention on. So let's first begin with renal outcomes with SGLT2 inhibitors, looking at patients both with type two diabetes and those with chronic kidney disease. So two dedicated renal outcome trials have been completed. The Credence trial with canagliflozin with participants with type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease and then subsequently the DAPA-CKD trial with dapagliflozin in patients with CKD with and without type 2 diabetes. 
We can see here that both of these uh, trials showed a significant reduction in the hard renal outcomes, which consisted of a doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage kidney disease, and the risk of renal or CV death. And that we can see that this composite primary outcome was driven by favorable effects on reducing hard renal outcomes as well as adverse cardiovascular outcomes in this very vulnerable patient population. So this was very exciting and favorable news uh, for patients both with and without type 2 diabetes who had chronic kidney disease. Now in terms of the uh, uh, renal effects of these drugs, a majority of the data is still within patients with type 2 diabetes, but this is typically what we see following the initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor. We see a reduction in albinuria around 30 to 50 percent, which is on par with that of an ACE inhibitor. Uh, a reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, uh, modest but consistent effects. About a 10 to 15 percent reduction in plasma uric acid as well as a slowing of EGFR, uh, and that is around, sorry, of EGFR decline in the neighborhood of about three to five milliliters a minute, and that is a clinically uh, meaningful outcome. In mechanistic studies, uh, it's also been demonstrated to have about a 20% reduction in hyperfiltration. So, of course, with this very positive and exciting news, of renal effects with SGLT2 inhibitors in reducing the relative risk of hard renal outcomes in really a variety of patient populations. Uh, many have questioned, well, what is the mechanism or mechanisms responsible for renal protection uh, within these patient populations? And the simple answer is that we don't no, but there have been several hypotheses put forward. And I think in order to approach this topic, I think we should start with what we do know. So let's focus our attention on panel B. What we know is that the renal protective effects of SGLT2 inhibitors are not secondary to A1C lowering or glycosuria. And we know that by evidence, particularly in the DAPA-CKD trial, where the, cardi where the renal protective effects were preserved irrespective of diabetes status. Furthermore, we know this is not secondary to weight loss or to blood pressure lowering. Now, when we look at the Kaplan-Meier curves of both the cardiovascular outcome trials and the dedicated uh, renal trials, we see that the Kaplan-Meier curves separate quickly, somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 12 months. So that implies that the mechanism or mechanisms responsible is indeed a rapid mechanism. And some people were quick to jump uh, at the hypothesis that this could be a hemodynamic mechanism. Now that's because when uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are administered in patients, often within the first three to four weeks, we see this very slight dip in EGFR and we see a return to baseline by 12 weeks. And that's a signal that this could be affecting intrarenal hemodynamics. And so that really points to naturesis. And I want to make the point, and I'll make it several times during my presentation, that the naturetic effects of SGLT2 inhibitors are unique because they occur very proximately in the kidney. And this allows for the distal kidney to see more salt. I think it might be worthwhile before we look at the prospective renal protective mechanisms, just to take a minute and remind ourselves of the altered renal hemodynamics in the setting of diabetic kidney disease. So because of insulin resistance and RAS activity, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, there's maladaptations in the kidney. And what we see is that the afferent uh, blood vessels of the kidney become vasodilated, whereas the efferent vessels of the kidney become vasoconstricted. And what that results in is a buildup of pressure in the glomerulus, glomerulus, and that raises interglomerular pressure, or we call that interglomerular hypertension. There's also changes that are irreversible in the kidney, such as mesangial expansion and a reduction in endothelial cell function. And ultimately, what this leads to, because of the in increased pressure, is hyperfiltration, which is a hallmark of early diabetic kidney disease. 
Now, if we just think of the kidney uh, in the same sense, um, but in more simpler terms, let's say as a sink, imagine for an instance, if you turn the tap on, that would be analogous to vasodilation. Now, when you turn the tap on the sink and the sink begins to fill, we know that the pressure builds as the sink builds, and that's analogous to interglomerular hypertension. Now, imagine that same sink that it's full and has the drain clogged. That's analogous to the vasoconstriction on the efferent side of the kidney. So to fix a diabetic kidney then, we need agents that address the vasoafferent dilatation and the vaso uh, constriction seen on the efferent side. Now we do have ACE inhibitors which cause vasoconstriction, but we didn't until we had SGLD2 inhibitors have agents that reduce the vasodilation on the afferent side. So uh, in this same uh, hypothesis, uh, a lot of people have put forth the concept of tubular glomerular feedback. So the idea here is similar to the sink. So SGLT2 inhibitors inhibit proximal uh, sodium. This causes proximal sodium absorption. This causes more delivery of sodium to the distal kidney. And there's a special organelle in the glomerulus which senses sodium in the distal kidney. And this, through adenosine signaling, causes vasoconstriction. So we're able to fix that diabetic kidney kidney rather by turning off the tap and reducing vasoconstriction if you will. So that was the panel that we just reviewed on the right. Now if we focus on the middle panel, several uh, people have put forth hypotheses regarding specific intrarenal factors um, from reducing renal inflammation to reducing intrarenal RAS, at least the bad components of RAS, and increasing the good components of RAS. And I'd, I'd classify those theories as biochemical pathways. Another popular theory, as we see here on the far left pathway, is an interesting uh, energy metabolism pathway uh, that's known as tubular interstitial hypoxia. So the way this works is that imagine SGLT2 is blocking the tubules from reabsorbing salt and glucose. So effectively, they're not working as much. Their workload goes down. That means their consumption of oxygen goes down. And overall, this results in an increase of oxygen in the kidney effectively. Now that's really important because there are hypoxic pathways in the kidney in the kidney, such as hypoxia inducible factor one, which if activated leads to fibrosis. So by increasing oxygenation in the kidney overall, by decreasing energy metabolism, we're actually blocking fibrosis and scarring with the kidney uh, with this protective mechanism. And finally, uh, I think it's important to uh, point out that uh, important risk factors for chronic kidney disease are modified with SGLT2 inhibitors. So things like reducing plasma uric acid, inflammation, and improving endothelial function are also good for the diabetic kidney. And so um, there are many uh, question marks, and that's why I've left two boxes of unanswered questions. Many researchers and scientists are busy trying to answer these questions, and I look forward to future research in this area. But I'd like to leave the kidney outcomes there and now transition into cardiovascular outcomes with SGLT2 inhibitors and move beyond the cardiovascular outcome trials and look at specific trials that have been completed recently in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So recently the DAPA-HF trial was completed with dapagliflozin compared to placebo in patients with reduced ejection fraction and elevated NT pro-BNP. And a more recent trial, the Emperor-reduced Emperor trial with empagliflozin was also completed in the similar patient population, perhaps with slightly greater degrees of reduced ejection fraction. And importantly, uh, both these trials enroll patients both with and without type 2 diabetes. So as we can see in the primary composite outcome, both of these trials and both of these drugs were associated with reducing important cardiovascular outcomes, including CV death and worsening heart failure. And as we can see, this was driven by both 
uh, reducing heart failure, as well as reducing CV death. And there was also important effects on preserving renal function in this very vulnerable patient population. So just like the renal effects, uh, there are several uh, sort of classic cardiovascular effects that are recognized with this drug class that I'd like to review now. One is a reduction in plasma volume. Again, this being secondary to naturesis. There is a bit of a debate, however, I should note, of the transient versus chronic nature of the naturesis. Uh, also reduction in extracellular fluid volume, which could be good for decreasing pulmonary congestion. And the really, really important point here is that this naturesis and diuresis does not occur at the expense of increasing neurohormones. So there's no activation of the sympathetic nervous system, therefore no compensatory uh, tachycardia and no activation of the RAS, which can really counteract diuretic and naturetic um, effects. Um, consistent with lowering plasma volume uh, chronically, and I'll show this data in a minute, there's been a reduction in LV mass noted with cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, a reduction of arterial stiffness, as well as a dampening in blood pressure. So. Uh, because again, we've seen uh, very strong uh, effects on the cardiovascular system and in a broad patient populations for heart failure and CV death, people have asked, well, what are the cardioprotective mechanisms for SGLT2 inhibitors? And what I'd like to do now is to just to review some of the evidence for the various mechanisms. So one mechanism is through reducing plasma volume. And much of the data that we had prior to this trial that's shown in this slide was centered in patients with type 2 diabetes. But importantly, this crossover study, which was completed with empagliflozin, uh, investigated patients both with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. And they looked at the effect of empagliflozin on naturesis and on blood volume and plasma volume. So starting in panel A, they demonstrated in patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure uh, at day one and day 14, naturesis was present. And very interestingly enough, shown in the uh, left-hand side of this panel, that when there was a loop diuretic present, there was actually a synergistic effect on naturesis, suggesting a synergy with a loop diuretic. Now, as we can see in panel two, this naturesis was uh, corresponding to reduction in blood volume and specifically a reduction in plasma volume compared to um, just placebo alone. Now, uh, we have many diuretic therapies that we use in the setting of heart failure, but I want to emphasize again, particularly what might be important with SGLT2 inhibitors is their proximal naturesis effects, unlike the other loop and thiazide diuretics, which act more distally. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors act proximally to cause naturesis, and this just allows for optimal salt delivery to the distal kidney and sensing of the macula densa. Now, uh, consistent with the reduction in plasma volume, there was theories that this could reduce left ventricular volumes. In this uh, study, the investigators studied patients with type 2 diabetes and again with heart failure. And as you can see shown in orange, treatment with empagliflozin compared to placebo uh, significantly reduced left ventricular end systolic volume compared to placebo after 36 weeks of chronic administration, giving more credence to the left ventricular volume hypothesis. Now, in the mediation analysis of the Ampereg outcome trial, uh, interestingly enough, uh, more than about 50% of the mortality benefit was actually attributed to a rise in hematocrit. And although the first thought is, well, maybe the rise in hematocrit is due to hemoconcentration, other investigators have gone on to suggest that this is secondary to an empagliflozin-induced increase in erythropoietin levels. Here in a sub-study of the EMPA heart trial that was conducted at the University of Toronto by Mazur and colleagues, they specifically studied uh, erythropoietin levels following empagliflozin administration. As you can see in red, compared to placebo in blue, empagliflozin significantly increased erythropoietin levels. 
and this corresponded to chronic increases in hematocrit as well as iron stores. Finally, um, although SGLT2 channels are not expressed in the heart, so it's difficult to come up with a theory of how SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are able to modify cardiac activity, there is one hypothesis, and that is through modifying the activity of what are called sodium hydrogen ion exchangers, and from here on in, I'll call them NHEs. So NHEs are widely expressed throughout the body. They are expressed, the subtype one is expressed in the heart. And in maladapted disease states, so when we have ischemia, the activity of NHE1 increases. And unfortunately, it's a bad thing because it raises cardiac salt and cardiac calcium levels. And we know this leads to myocardial dysfunction, hypertrophy, apoptosis, and eventually heart failure. So I think it's very interesting that there is structural evidence, as shown in this slide, that various SGLD2 inhibitors can actually bind to these NHE uh, channels. And moreover, not only do they just bind to the channels, but there is in vitro data to suggest that they can functionally dampen the effect of, those, of that NHE activity. And that would be, again, a very good thing for the failing heart. And that is a hypothesis whereby SGLT2 can have a uh, direct effect on the heart through these NHE channels. So I know we went through that rather quickly, and so what I want to do now is to spend a few minutes summarizing. As shown in panel A and panel B, there have been several trials uh, in many broad uh, patient uh, phenotypes showing consistent effect on the reduction for heart failure and for the risk of cardiovascular death. And the question is, what are the mechanisms? Like the kidney, because we see the Kaplan-Meier curves happen quickly, we think that this is likely hemodynamic. And we know that this is not happening through mechanisms of other cardiovascular therapies because uh, the effective SGLT2 inhibitors are additive. Now, most folks believe that there are no uh, direct cardiac effects of SGLT2 inhibitors because there's an absence of SGLT2 channels in the heart. And we know that this is not happening through glycosuria. Again, the heart failure trials with the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, were positive and protective irrespective of diabetes status. So this is not a blood sugar story. The four sort of hypotheses that I showed you are quickly summarized here. Panel A, we remind you that uh, this drug class promotes naturesis in the proximal kidney. This decreases plasma volume, uh, decreases LV volumes, and that's good for reducing uh, myocardial stretch and increasing the risk for arrhythmias, as well as reducing the potential for remodeling. In panel B, we looked at hematocrit and showed evidence that empagliflozin increase erythropoietin secretion, and this is good for the failing heart because more oxygen uh, is there for cardiac tissue. Now in panel C, I mentioned there are many endocrine and biochemical hypotheses for cardiac protection with SGLT2 inhibitors. The one that I highlighted was with sodium hydrogen ion exchangers because they are directly expressed in the heart and SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to both functionally and structurally interact with these channels. Uh, finally, like uh, the kidney effects uh, shown in panel D, we know that SGLT2 inhibitor class does favorable things in modifying cardiovascular risk factors, reducing uric acid, albinuria, blood pressure, A1C, body weight, and I can't uh, be but optimistic that this that these are good effects for a failing heart. So in terms of the landscape for SGLD2 inhibitors in 2020, 2021, we've really seen uh, quite an advancement. Uh, we've seen now translation into the non-diabetic kidney and the non-diabetic heart. Uh, this has actually uh, made its way into international diabetes, cardiology, and renal guidelines. Uh, some actually advocating for the use of SGLT2 uh, irrespective of diabetes status and some in advance of metformin.
And so um, I'll end by thanking you so much for your attention. There are a number of cardio and renal mechanisms. I'll end by saying that there at this time is no one unifying mechanism and they may not be mutually exclusive. In other words, there may be many mechanisms responsible for these very important cardiac and renal protective effects that we see in patients with type 2 diabetes and beyond. Thank you very much. <laughs>